Hi, I'm David Herzl. This is my introductory statement for the series I'm producing on uh, how to teach world history using the World History Workbook, a book that, uh, that I wrote, but probably more importantly, that I've been using in my own classroom in some edition or some form for 20 years, I think, each, every year three sections, two semesters, three sections each semester. <laughs> so a lot of years, a lot of students, a lot of projects I've graded. <coughs> and I can say that the book worked. I, uh, I'm not the only one who uses it. It's been uh, adopted by a number of um, uh, mostly small private universities where world history sections are, uh, are seminar style. The book is, is I think is appropriate to a seminar style because it asks a lot of questions and it asks a lot from students to not only read and remember but also to think and to uh, use critical thinking in their analysis of historical problems. Uh, I think if you ask professors at universities what is it that you really want your students to learn more than anything else? I think that most of them will answer critical thinking. That's what they want their students to learn, whether they're in biology or math or, uh, or history. That's the, that's the purpose of this, of this class, really, is to get students to use critical thinking to resolve problems, to trust themselves, to be able to ask big questions and to answer those questions using their reason, not just using their belief, which is a common pitfall in our, our modern world that people believe that, uh, and teach also, that if they believe something that it's valid. But obviously all beliefs are not, not valid, and a lot of beliefs are invalid. And what invalidates them is reason. The book is organized around uh, primary sources, which are included in the, in the back of the book, all but two that I've used are uh, included in the appendix. There are projects that ask questions, and the way I plan to organize this, uh, this discussion series is around the projects. So altogether there are 33 projects. Each project has uh, several questions. Um, I will produce one, vi one video discussion for each project, so uh, 33. Some will be longer than others. Some will require more uh, introduction than others. This is essentially how I led the class during COVID. I, the, the method for the, uh, that the book expects is really a Socratic method, in-person, question and answer, uh, challenging students or getting students to challenge themselves to question what they believe, to a question how they have arrived at, at, uh, at their conclusions to get them to connect a conclusion and an argument to, uh, to some evidence. This is the, the foundation of the, of the class. It surprised me that the book really worked very well remotely. I, I made presentations, weekly presentations that students would watch, but the, but the fact that, that, the, that I require that students write their answers by hand in the book and follow certain rules of writing, I think made it a little bit more personal than, uh, than uh, some of the other remote uh, methods. Of course, I had office hours and I could meet with students on Zoom, which I did, but a lot of students didn't want to do that. My classes are fairly large. I think during COVID, my classes were about 50 students each, three sections each semester with 50 students. And I would say no more than 10 or 15 actually Zoomed me. But I had them produce videos where they would, uh, with it, which they would upload and uh, send to me. And the videos would be reading aloud their answers to projects. So this, this, worked, this worked pretty well. I require that, and I really strongly recommend that anyone who teaches this class or teaches really any GE class require students to follow certain rules of writing. I, I tell students that a native speaker is never wrong. So long as 
as they are discussing with their parents or hanging out with their friends or writing personal letters or texting or whatever, it's whatever, how it, they construct the language, they build the language, they change the language, the languages in their native languages are in their powers. So it's not up to me to tell them how to do those things or how to speak or how to write or how to text. But at a university environment, in a university environment, we're using a common language. And that common language requires uh, a certain agreement, maybe limited, but still a, 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 a foundation of agreement on the meaning of language and the structure of language. Since we're uh, doing the class in English and the text is in English and the primary sources are all translated into English, some were originally in English, but not, not many, then English is the language that, uh, that we use. And I require the students, for example, uh, never write in first person. None of their answers can use first person at all, except the last answer, which is actually about them. The last, very last project is about their ancestry. And in that one, of course, they can use first person since they are the subject. But that's the problem, is that I don't want students being the subject of their answer. I want the material to be the subject of their answer. I want the primary source to be the subject of their answer. So they need to write in third person, not second person, not first person. This is so that they mean what they say. If they, if they say what they mean, then they'll mean what they say. And this is very important that they learn how to say what they mean and to mean what they say. <coughs> and sometimes students will come to me and to other professors as well and, and instructors and teachers at high school and, and, and tell them, well, you knew what I mean. But if, if we're going to discern for them what they really meant and what they mean is something different from what they said, then I have to wonder who's doing the project, did they understand what they meant, <laughs> did they intend to, to mean what they said, and so on. So I never allow students to tell me that I know what they mean because I won't allow students to expect me to think for them. I, I'll guide them and I'll question them, but I can't think for them. They need to do their own thinking, they need to do their own writing. So the, the, the writing is very important. I think the, uh, somehow the connection between physical writing and learning is significant. And uh, it's, it's helpful to see their handwriting anyway. It's helpful for them to learn how to write legibly. And it's helpful for them to learn how to construct an answer uh, using a pen and paper. I limit word counts in these projects, usually to 40, 50, sometimes 60 words. Not all of them are limited, but uh, with most of the projects I limit word counts because I think it's equally important that students, uh, that students write concisely, that they articulate a presentation carefully, thoughtfully, usually involving rewriting and, um, and a, a, a concise, accurate statement comes out of that. And I've had a lot of students say at the end of this class, they learned, they learned a lot about writing. They learned partly how to think, they learned critical thinking, they learned a set of sets of terms, they learned a lot about history and historical people and events. But for some of them, the writing is the most important. And for me, it's as important as all of the other lessons. They, they need to learn to write, to write in a public sphere, to write in a public forum, to present their opinions in letters to the editor, in blogs, in, uh, in speeches, and also to how, to how to read. And learning to write and learning to read obviously go hand in hand. Uh, a lot of students at public universities haven't learned this, these lessons very well and uh, they, they need to learn them in an accountable way. So the way I'll conduct these, these discussions will be uh, first with project one, second with project two, and so on, and I'll do 33 of them and post them in my uh, YouTube library, whatever it's called, the YouTube, you know, I can't remember. I'll post them on YouTube under, under my name. Uh, if you have any questions, you can, always, you can always write me, you can make comments, uh, you can email me, and I hope you enjoy it. Good luck.